Good morning. morning. I'm so glad that you're part of our worship here this morning, this Sunday. My name is Dave Martin, and I'm pastor here at St. Paul's United Church of Christ. My thanks to Chip Hoover and to Terry Miller for uh, recording our worship this morning and taking care of the live streaming and the sound system, and to Darlene Hoover for our music this morning. When my younger brother was a Boy Scout, he and a couple of other scouts had an opportunity to spend a month uh, walking around the White Mountains in New Hampshire. One Sunday, my father and I and our dog, Rocky, a border collie mix, went to visit. We met my brother at the trailhead and uh, walked up to his rather primitive campsite in the woods and then continued on up to the top of the mountain, which was a long wooded ridge. The trail continued on down the other side of the ridge, but we stopped for a leisurely lunch and then planned to return the way we had come. Yet when we were ready to leave, Rocky, our dog, was nowhere to be seen. We called, we hollered, we whistled, we, and, for, and we did that for a half an hour, but he didn't come. We decided to split up. My father would go back down the way we came, and my brother and I would go down the other way and meet up at the road. And as we went down, we continued to call for Rocky, Five minutes down the hill, we, uh, the dog came running up the trail. He was looking as frightened and worried and relieved as we probably looked, yet a lot more tired. Our fear of losing him and his fear of being abandoned met face to face. We had an, an impulse to scold him but an even greater desire to hug him. More than once, God's people were afraid that God had abandoned them. More than once, God's worried that God's people had completely lost their way. The story of the golden calf in Exodus that we will hear this morning needs to be heard in the context of this great mutual fear. We, too, live in a time of fear and uncertainty. From this story, we hear the opening discord of God's anger, followed by Moses' notes of conciliation, and the final chord of God's faithfulness, a chord that will play more loudly throughout our sacred story until it becomes a crescendo of forgiveness, the cross of Christ. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Whatever our fears of abandonment, no matter how badly we lose our way, God's love and forgiveness abides for each of us and all of us. And the spirit of God's forgiving and embracing love, I welcome all of you to our worship people of every skin color and ethnic background, all genders, body shapes, and sizes, all physical, mental, and emotional abilities and moments, people who are old or young or a little bit of each, queer or straight or a little bit of each, doubting or believing or a little bit of each. I encourage each of you to reach out your hands in every direction to bless and welcome the people you are sharing your space with, and then your neighbors beyond their immediate sight, and strangers afar to this moment of belonging, connecting, and worship. Let us celebrate and praise God's boundless love together. Let us worship God. I invite you to join me in our responsive call to worship and encourage you to speak quietly and let God's spirit uh, carry your words into our worship space and into the world. Our God is full of love and will not act in anger. From every thought of vengeance, 
our God will turn away, remembering the covenant once promised to God's people. Let us pray together. Patient, loving God, you never give up on us. Even when we give up on you, renew our worship this morning as we recommit to loving only you. We pray in your holy name. Amen. For those who hear it, God's gift of forgiveness brings peace. The peace of Christ be with you, brothers and sisters. Let us share the peace of Christ with one another, trying to stay more or less where we are. Living God, you brought the Israelites out of Egypt toward a land of promise, but in their fear and uncertainty, uh, it led them to doubt you and to worship on their own terms. We confess our sins before our God and before one another. God of all ages, you have chosen us as your own, yet we so often live as if it were not so. We succumb to things which are not good for us. We believe we know better than you. We refuse to put our trust in your promises. Sweep away our foolishness and bring us back to a trusting relationship with the one who has lovingly created us and longs to be our strength and our life. Just as Moses pleaded with God to forgive God's people, so Christ stands with us. We are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Good morning. My name is Joy Gobrecht. Let us pray. Loving God, open our ears to hear your word and draw us closer to you, that the whole world may be one with you as you are one with us in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Hebrew people were alone and frightened in a new land. Their leader had disappeared up a mountain and hadn't been seen since. Their instinct was to return to the gods they knew, the gods of Egypt. When God's wrath burned hot for them, Moses reminded God that God needed to learn the ways of the people before the people could learn the ways of God. Our reading from Exodus begins. 
When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us, who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Take off your gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, formed it in a mold, and cast an image of a calf. And they said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. They rose early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone, so that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and of you I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, It was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath. Change your mind and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he had planned to bring on his people. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. And our gospel reading is from Luke chapter 23, verse 34. While crucified and suffering greatly, Jesus forgives those who crucify and mock him. Our reading from Luke begins. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. God is still speaking. Spread the word. In the first church I served as pastor, the confirmation curriculum that I used suggested that at the end of each learning session, each of the participants be blessed with words and with the watery mark of the cross. The church's motto was, blessed to be a blessing. So blessing the 30 youth and adult in our confirmation ministry sounded like a very compelling idea to me. It never occurred to me that blessed objects might be considered more important than blessing people. There was a small unused wooden baptismal font in our chapel that I borrowed for this purpose. About two months into confirmation, I was confronted by the church historian who told me that the font had a plaque on it and belonged in the chapel with all the other historical objects. This in a church where people had been encouraged to support the church with the promise that whatever they gave would have a plaque on it memorial memorializing a loved one. In the pain, disorientation, and even fear of our grief, the death of a loved one, it's only natural to try to fill the yawning gap of loss with something tangible so that the memory of our loved ones will continue so that we can have the consolation that their name will be remembered by the church. In our story from Exodus, 
God had, a few months prior, freed the Israelites from slavery in Egypt and then gathered them at Mount Sinai, where, through Moses, God claims God's identity as the one who brought the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt and gave them the Ten Commandments. Moses read those commandments to the people twice, and the people promised twice to do everything that God said, beginning with not creating any objects of worship uh, to, that, would, that would be worshiped instead of God. God then called Moses up to the mountain again. And we learn at the end of Exodus chapter 24 that Moses was gone for 40 days and 40 nights, which is Bible speak for a long, long time. Long enough for the Israelites to fear that Moses had abandoned them and maybe God had left them too. Like anxious children who need a comfort object, the Israelites needed to create a comforting object who they could worship as their liberator, their God. Yet God expects greater faithfulness from God's people who had just twice promised to follow in God's ways. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our story from Exodus unfolds with a series of four scenes in which the phrase who brought us up out of the land of Egypt recurs, an echo of the phrase that God uses to describe God's self and the giving of the Ten Commandments. Yet the first, in the first three scenes of our story, the phrase is a very distorted echo of God's self-description and the Ten Commandments. Only in the fourth scene does Moses get it right. Scene one, Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt. The first scene focuses on the people and the absence of their leader, Moses. The people of Israel express fear because they've lost their human leader. Moses was sequestered with God in an extended executive session. He was gone so long the people grew afraid. When the people saw Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make a God for us who shall go before us. As for Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. The last phrase is especially worth noting because it's only half true. Do the people get it right? Did Moses bring the people out of Egypt? Well, on a human level, he did. Moses was the human God called to bring the people out of Egypt. But on a deeper theological level, the people do not get it right. God brought the people out of Egypt. As the first line of the Ten Commandments says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. As a commentary on the first of the commandments, scene one expresses what happens when God's people fall prey to the temptation of confusing the human image of God that is a spiritual leader, such as a pastor or parent or teacher or mentor, with God. When that leader disappears, humans can lose sight of God and become afraid and lose faith in their direction in life. And having lost sight of God, become afraid, and in turn losing their direction, the people long for a visible image of God to lead them. Come, they said, make a God for us who shall go before us. Scene two. This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. 
This second scene focuses on Aaron. Aaron gathers all the gold, costume jewelry from the people, melts it down, and makes a golden calf. So what was Aaron's sin? Traditionally, most interpretations of the story accuse Aaron of making an image of a false god. But that's not really where Aaron went wrong. As indicated by Aaron's proclamation in verse 5, tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord, Aaron's mistake is to make a false image of a true God. Like the people in scene one, Aaron gets it slightly right and mostly wrong. Aaron knows that Moses did not lead the people out of Israel. Yahweh did. And thus he proclaims a festival to Yahweh. But in order to give the people something to follow, Aaron makes a false image of the true God which God had forbidden in the Ten Commandments. Our idols are often false things that we worship in place of God, such as money or popularity or even our own selves, or perhaps the Pittsburgh Steelers, or my new used car, or my old torn t-shirts with their many memories. But idols can also be our false images of the true God, things we associate so much with God that we worship them instead of God, perhaps the church building, perhaps the King James Version of the Lord's Prayer, perhaps the American flag wrapped around the cross, perhaps the Baltimore Ravens. This form of idol can actually be even more dangerous to faith than outright idols. No earthly image can fully capture the infinite God. Scene three, your people whom you, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt. In scene three, we switch to the mountaintop where Yahweh is consulting with Moses. Yahweh's alert rings on his iPhone Perhaps that's why some people worship their iPhones. And Yahweh reads a report of what Aaron and the people had just done down in the valley. Yahweh turns to Moses and says, Go down at once. Your people, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, have acted perversely. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt. Notice twice more the key phrase, brought up out of the land of Egypt. First, even Yahweh does not get it quite right. Yahweh says to Moses, hey, they are your people. You brought them up out of the land of Egypt. And then, quoting the people, Yahweh cites how the people had confused the visible, finite, earthly image with the invisible, infinite, heavenly God. Like a marriage partner who just discovered their partner's infidelity in the first year of marriage, Yahweh remembers with pain the promises God's people twice made to walk faithfully in covenant with Yahweh. Yahweh seems to lose trust. Their relationship seems to be grounded on a sandbar. And then Yahweh does the unthinkable. God offers to scrap Abraham's descendants and start over with Moses and his descendants. Now let me alone, so that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and you will <coughs> and you I will make a great nation. Remembering that back in Genesis chapter twelve, God had promised to make a great nation of Abraham's descendants. Well, they were many in numbers, but they certainly were not great in a spiritual sense. So by saying, of you, I will make a great nation, Yahweh was offering to make Moses 
the new Abraham, to start over. Scene four. Your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt with great power. In the fourth and final scene, Moses risks telling the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Israel is your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt. This is the fifth time that the key phrase repeats in the story. And for effect, Moses adds to it with great power and a mighty hand. Yahweh had offered Moses the tempting choice, chance to be the new Abraham. But Moses throws the promise to Abraham back at God in a bold act of intercessory prayer. You promised. You promised Abraham. You promised Isaac. You promised Israel by your own name. You promised. Moses concludes his prayer on behalf of the sinful Israelites with a beautiful reference to the stars of heaven. Linking the past to the future, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel on one horizon, their far-flung descendants on the other, stretched between them as a dazzling sea of stars, so many stars. And then comes the narrator's startling remark about God canceling the disaster that had been ordered for God's people. Perhaps God looked at those stars. Perhaps God saw that Moses was a star of courage, truth, mercy, and faithfulness. And then God remembered God's promises. And God remained faithful to Israel despite Israel's struggle to remain faithful to God. In fact, over time, God's faithfulness and love only grows deeper and wider. Over a millennia later, we learn that God so loves the whole world that God sends God's only son. And when the powers that be felt threatened by Jesus' preaching of the kingdom of God and by his acts of compassion, mercy, and forgiveness, the leaders, the people, and the soldiers mock him and crucify him. No one comes to Jesus' aid in the way that Moses came to the aid of the Israelites. All were bystanders at the very least, perhaps even us, trying to keep a low prof profile, not wanting to make trouble or draw attention to ourselves, our families, our church. But if the best thing that can be said about the bystanders is that they don't get their names in the paper, realize that could be also the worst thing about them. Despite the awful violence done to him, despite the denials and betrayal and faithlessness, despite the many silent bystanders, Jesus prays, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. What kind of God do we have? What kind of God created earth, chose Abraham, brought Israel out of Egypt, gave us the Ten Commandments, who forgives from the cross? A God who keeps promises. Sometimes keeping those promises means that God has to forgive our fears, our infidelity, our mockery, our inaction in the face of human need. But that is the nature of the one who claims us. God is faithful, and God will keep promises. Will we, in return? Amen. As we enter into a time of prayer, I want to uh, lift up to you uh, the folks down in Louisiana, especially, who've been battered by multiple hurricanes and are growing tired of all the storms. I uh, want to lift up to you uh, 
Joyce Hartley, whom I learned last night, had uh, emergency appendectomy on uh, Friday, but apparently is doing well. I still haven't had a chance to talk with her m myself. Lift up Nancy Miller, who's um, learned that she's dealing with Parkinson's, and we hope that she will have uh, good treatment. And I also want to lift up those who are returning from a time of imprisonment into society and face all of the stress uh, that comes with that, all of the hard work, all of the challenges, and that very, very difficult move from uh, prison back into society. Are there other joys or concerns we'd like to share at this time? Yes. Th thank you, Jenny, for, for sharing that. Uh, and uh, I'm glad that you felt held by the prayers of, of so many here. Oh, Holden. Oh, ha happy birthday, Joy. Happy birthday. Shall we be together in prayer? Holy and uh, gracious God, we're glad for this opportunity to be in your presence, to be aware that you are here with us, even as you are every moment of our lives and in every place that we go. We thank you for your faithfulness to us, even when we are faithless. We thank you for keeping on turning towards us, even in a, when in our fears, we hang on to other things for security and for hope, other things than you. When we see you in small objects, help us to open our eyes, to open our hearts, to see the vastness of who you are as creator, as lover, as sustainer, as one who redeems us. Help us to find peace in your presence. Help us to know that you are a forgiving God who helps us to start over every morning who helps us to make every day a new day filled with your promises. Give us the strength and courage, the mercy and kindness of Moses to take risks on behalf of your beleaguered people, those we know and those we don't, those who are hurting and suffering and loss. And, oh God, we know so many of those folks right now in this time of pandemic, when fires and storms seem to keep on raging. Give them your peace. Help us to be instruments of your peace. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, who forgave us from the cross and who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
you're invited to leave your offerings in the uh, bowls in the back in the narthex if you haven't already. Remembering that the wonderful works of God surround us. Remembering that they prompt us to gratitude. That the generosity of God exceeds all of our limits. How will our manner of life reflect the abundance of God's mercy? Surely our offerings are one measure, one way that we can respond. Let us pray together. All the world is your vineyard, O God, and we are its laborers. The fruits of our labors are yours, but you allow us to manage them for you. Most we use for our own benefit, but today we bring a portion to help others as you have commanded. We do so joyfully, asking you to bless the work of your church here and everywhere. Help us to be more faithful stewards. Amen. God of the nations, you delivered the Israelites from slavery. You delivered them from idolatry. You provide for us and deliver us daily. Hear our prayers of thanks for all that we have to be thankful for. Thank you for keeping your promises in the past and today. Amen. I invite you now to turn to your neighbor near or far and from your seat to bless them with the words, May God be enough.